evening's presentation is Reawakening Agile with OKRs with the marvellous Alan Kelly, who you can see on your screen right now. It's lovely to have him. Uh, your facilitators this evening, this is all of us, but on duty uh, this evening, Farah. Say hello, Farah. There she is. And uh, Farah's going to be the Zoom wizard, and uh, Gordon's going to be dealing with a Q&A. So it's Gordo. Hi, Gordo. And myself, who uh, is supposedly presenting. Just a reminder of our vision, it's about uh, discussing, creating a, a mechanism to discuss lean and agile methods, uh, including coaching and other agile roles, and to provide a platform for you all, for our wonderful participants and our community, to give you an opportunity to speak and to present about things you're interested in. And we've had that, you know, in the last couple of events, certainly uh, the, the Munway and JF presentation, we had members of our own community presenting. So that was really great. So if you've got something you would like to share or present with us all, we'd love to see it. Code of conduct is very simple, really. It's lots of words, but it basically means just be excellent to each other. Be conscious of, uh, uh, you know, language, etc., and tone, blah, blah, blah. But we do like to, to create, uh, you know, an environment where people can discuss and disagree with each other. So that's it. Uh, so really, I'm going to pass over to Alan right now to kick off with Reawakening Agile with OKRs. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, I was, I've just posted some links in the chat window. The, the reason for them will start to become obvious in a moment. Um, uh, I, uh, this is a, a new one for me. It's the first time I've done the same presentation twice in one day. Because earlier today, I, I did this presentation for, for Rolls-Royce, would you believe? Uh, so I feel honoured. Um, I've, I've presented at two different conferences on the same day before now by running across London. But it's the first time I've actually done the same presentation. It's one of the things of um, I was living in a virtual world. Right. So reawakening Agile with OKRs. If you don't know, OKRs stand for Objectives and Key Results, although I increasingly feel as if what they should stand for is Outcomes and Key Results. I think that in some ways um, describes them better, um, but maybe that will come out as we go on. And yes, I, I have a book to push, um, so please rush out and buy the book. Um, no, don't rush out it's too fast. Um, I've set up a book draw. I'm going to give away two copies. Uh, one physical, one electronic. Uh, the person who comes out first gets to choose which they want, and the second person gets the leftover. Um, so alankelly.next slash book draw, same links in the chat. If you wonder over there, share your name and email address. We we won't publish the email addresses. I might drop you an email tomorrow, but um, give us your name, um, and I'll put it into a spinner later on, and we'll pull out a couple of winners and um, then I can contact you with the email and send you the book. Okay, so the other thing I wanna ask is, this is using another site, which some of you may have seen called Menti, and the link's there in the window. Go to Menti and put in the number 11213887. And what I would like to know when I press the button, um, how many of you heard of OKRs before tonight, before this session? Um, Menti should be showing you um, a yes and a no. If you click on one, okay, one person's heard of them. Uh, two, three, four, uh, seven. I'm not presenting this because I think it should pop up on your screen. Come on, there's 28 of you on this call. Only seven of you have answered, 10 of you, good, good. Oh, this is looking good. No, no, I, you see, so this presentation isn't, um, isn't really constructed as an introduction. Um, I've got some words on what OKRs are, but um, they're, they're not the focus. So, okay, good. You, you've, it looks like everybody has come across these. And, and to be honest, this, this is the state I was in two or three years ago. I'd, I'd heard of OKRs. I'd read a bit about them. I thought I knew what they were. Um, and then I was coaching at a large financial institution, which was not a bank. I, I'm temperamentally unsuited to banks, I think. Um, it was another type of financial institution. And um, in amongst all the, the agile stuff we had going on, it was suddenly decreed that thou shalt do OKRs as well. And they're like, oh, scratched our heads and me and the other coaches ran around and said, we better swat up fast on OKRs. And that was the start of a, a, a grand learning experience. And I have to say, in the beginning, 
I was skeptical about OKRs. Um, I thought, you know, it's just another command and control. It's another management technique. It's, it's flaw, blah, blah, blah. But I surprised myself over the months working with them. I realized I quite liked them and I realized they worked. And when I thought about it, they fit right in with Agile. And I started to write my notes down on, on OKRs and then lockdown happened and those notes became a book. And as I worked through it, I saw more and more ways where I think they've got real potential to, to do something special. So one more question on the Mentimeter. Um, how, who are using OKRs or perhaps planning to? Um, yes, you're using them, you plan to use them or no, no planning. Good, okay. So we've got some experience in the room. So that's always great when we've got people who are, who are actually using them. And a bit like Agile itself, no two people's experiences are quite the same, but that's useful because we can compare and contrast and learn from each other. Okay. Okay, perhaps not surprising there's not so many people who don't plan on using them. Perhaps the people who don't plan on using them haven't signed up for this presentation, but good. Okay, that, that gives me a feel. That's, that's like when you say, put your hands up. So let, let's uh, move on. Um, so it is 2021, we do have to talk about the virus before we go any further, you know, hands, feet, nose and mouth, that kind of stuff. The virus, the Agile virus. Uh, the Agile virus was first identified in about 2001, although there is reason to believe that it was circulating in the wild earlier than that. What has become apparent is the Agile virus spreads through the use of digital technology. As more and more organizations adopt digital technology and try and become digital businesses, the Agile virus spreads further and faster than before. Before 2001, although to those of us who've been working in the industry, it feels like computers were everywhere, they were a fraction of what they are today. Um, before 2001, there wasn't a lot of Agile around and relatively there wasn't a lot of digital technology. The more organizations that digitize, the more organizations that move across to a digital business environment, the more we see agile. So that's one of the reasons why you see more agile in, um, in marketing, because marketing has really been affected by digital technology. And after software, I would guess it's the second most agile, adopt, second biggest adopter of agile. And like any virus, and you're all experts in viruses now, I know, um, the virus mutates and, and this is good news and it's bad news. Uh, it's good news because you can mutate the Agile virus to your environment and you can improve the Agile virus. You know, all those retrospectives, you can find new ways of doing stuff. You can break new territory. This is really good that you can modify Agile itself. It's also really bad because you may have had these teams that do a stand-up meeting in the morning and that's the only bit of Agile they adopt and they call themselves Agile. Or they mutate the Agile virus so they, they do two weeks of, of, of documents and two weeks of planning and two weeks of coding and, and, and six weeks of testing. Uh, you, you, they, they mutate the Agile virus in a way which to many of us is decidedly un-Agile, but that, that's the way Agile is. You're allowed to change it, it changes. What is clear, it's become quite clear in the last few years, is there are two distinct strains of the Agile virus. Um, the, the, the one version, I started calling it mild Agile uh, and um, I now call it corporate Agile. But honestly, trying to find a poli polite term for this can be difficult. Um, this is the kind of Agile you typically get in a bank or any other large corporate setting. Um, to be honest, it's better than what went before, but it's a mild form of Agile. It's not going to kill the organization. It doesn't pose a massive risk. It will improve things a bit, but really it doesn't live up to the dreams and the expectations of many of us who were at the start of the Agile movement 15, 20 years ago. There are teams around. Uh, there are teams that do another version of Agile, which I'll call Radical Agile. And these are teams which are very fast at learning. They're very fast at innovative. These are the really high performing teams. And there's, there's two or three companies in the consultancy space who do this and do this well. And my God, they can charge top dollar. 
It tends to be more product companies, but there are consultancies out there to do it. And these more radical organizations, it may look, it, yes, it's more risky. Radical implies risk, but my God, do they see the benefit. And, and that's the radical we all really want, isn't it? It's, it's the agile, which is better and faster and, and fun to be with. So two strains of the agile virus, corporate agile, you know, it's a weak and formally agile. Organizations emphasize reproduction. It typically has a very high R value. Organizations, organizations define how thou shalt do agile and they cutty cook the teams out. As a result, teams do all their sprints and retrospectives and so on, but it's, it's, it's sadly lacking. Um, what happens is the effectiveness value, we might call that E, is quite low. So you have high reproduction, but not very high effectiveness. You tend to find that the more radical form of the agile, you get much higher effectiveness, but it's more difficult to replicate that, that there's something unique in there. So corporate agile emphasizes high reproduction and sometimes leaves effectiveness lagging. Um, the administrative processes are intact. Staff are not particularly motivated by agile. There's a lack of fun, lack of experimentation, a big important thing. And that leads to a lack of learning um, and equally a lack of unlearning. It's no good just adding stuff. We have to take stuff away. If we're going to be really effective, we can't just layer on more and more processes and ideas and techniques. We have to take some away. But corporate agile, it doesn't have experimentation. It's scared of unlearning. It becomes a bit bloated and a lack of fun. That commoditization undermines the competitive advantage because you get this commoditized form of agile, which, which all the organizations do, and everyone keeps their head above water, but few people excel. Still, and this is really important, we, we, can, we can scoff at corporate agile, but it's still better than what went before. For many of these large corporations, this high R, low E combination is better than what they were doing before even if they don't reach the sunny uplands. So my suggestion is that OKRs can help here, which is a really funny suggestion if you start from the place I started from a couple of years ago, which is that OKRs are a reinvention of command and control. And they're a corporate management type thing. Um, what I've come to realize is OKRs represent an alternative to the project model, and it's an alternative which enhances autonomy. So when I say alternative to the project model, you may know this as no projects, or my later name for no projects, continuous deliver digital. Um, this is the same idea that SAFE and other lean methods and espouses value streams. Some people talk about products over projects, other teams, but other places about teams over projects, and or just the plain Spotify model. Constant idea is software doesn't end. You have teams that support products and those teams roll from one set of changes to another set of changes and they're constantly adding value and they're looking on the one hand of what needs doing on the other and the second hand, they're delivering this stuff and they're closing the loop. The problem is these models don't fit into the traditional project model and therefore management doesn't know how to run them, doesn't know how to govern them. And I think OKRs offers a partial solution to that problem, at the same time allowing teams to have more autonomy. Another good thing about OKRs is they come from Intel and Google, and they're great success stories in the world, aren't they? And we all want to copy them. And even Bono uses them for his initiatives. So what could be better? And big management consultancies, you know, the big brand names, they like these things. So unlike Agile, which spent the first 15 years trying to be management friendly and now it's become management friendly has alienated the engineers. These things start off as management friendly because a big consultant comes in and says, you'll pay me 5,000 a day. I tell you to do OKRs and people do it. And OKRs fit well with Agile. They're very iterative in nature. They're test driven in nature. They support independent units, evolved authority and they're outcome orientated. One of the big challenges in, in corporate agile is people are so busy burning down the backlog, doing stuff. They lose sight of what they're actually trying to achieve. They can't see the wood for the trees. 
OKRs are outcome orientated. It's not about how many story points you deliver, how many stories, what your velocity is and all the rest of it. It's what difference can you make? Can you create an outcome that moves the needle, that benefits your organization, your customers and society? And OKRs are failure tolerant. OKRs allow people to have failures. In the project model, if you think you can have a failure, you replan and you grab more resources to not fail. OKRs deliberately set out to have some failures. And I know we're all supposed to view failure as a positive word these days and failure is okay. And, but we're wired, aren't we, not to want to do failure. But we overlook the positive values of failure. I'm sure you all immediately think of that quote about failure is learning. Yeah, great way to learn, have a failure. Perhaps for me, more important, failures are motivated for change. When you do something and it works, you've got no motivation to change. You do it the same way because it was successful. When you have a failure, you're motivated to do something different. And OKRs accept failure as part and parcel of everyday work. So objectives and key results. As I said, they're used by Intel and in Google. The objective, what do you want? What do you really, really want? As the Spice Scales would say, the key results the important contributors, the bounding criteria, the acceptance criteria, the small goals which build towards the objective. These are all different ways of looking at key results. And I've slowly come to the conclusion that depending on what the objective is, they can be all of these or one of these and they can be different. Sometimes they are just a shopping list of bits to build and you hope that the whole will be more than the sum of the parts. More likely their acceptance criteria and we look at outcomes, what's beneficial, what adds value. Not, these are not milestones or tick boxes. And we try to make them quantified. We try and put numbers against them, which is a bit of a double-edged sword, but that's, that's the idea. Objectives are not epics. There's a tendency to look at objectives and key results if you're familiar with Agile and say, oh, objectives are just epics and the key results are stories. Well, they're not. Objectives are something different. They're, they're perhaps better thought of as hypotheses about the outcome you need. And the key results are not stories. They're more likely to be acceptance criteria. So one of the things to ask yourself is, how do I make these acceptance criteria testable? What test am I going to apply here so I know whether I've satisfied the key results and ultimately the objective? So you may start to spot some parallels already. I think um, we can think of OKRs as, as almost test first management. What is it we want to do? What are our success criteria, conditions of satisfaction, acceptance? What are we going to measure ourselves by? Let's define that up front and now let's go on and deliver it. So th there's elements of a test first management strategy here for me. I already alluded to this, OKRs enhance the team authority, which may sound a bit odd if you come across what I call cascading OKRs, where they're, they're passed down from on high. But I think they make space for teams to have autonomy. You've got your teams. And for me, teams are, are fundamentally key to setting objectives. Teams are not given OKRs from the outside. They are responsible for creating their own OKRs. And when they write their OKRs at the start of a quarter, they are defining a box. And they are saying to the rest of the organization, this is what you can expect from us. This is what you're going to get out of us. They allow the team to define their space. And within that space, they can have autonomy. And if I put it like this, the box is an API. The box is saying, here's our OKRs. This is the interface that you can expect from us to communicate with us on. And within this box, it's abstracted away. Those of you who are outside the box, you don't care about what's in the box. This team will work out for themselves the best way to deliver this stuff. They'll work out how they want to organize, whether they want to share testing, have dedicated people or whatever, and they will decide what needs doing to meet that outcome. Because it's not about stories or epics or features or any of that stuff. It's about outcomes. So the team gets to decide that. That's why I say, OKRs enhance team authority because they allow space for that. So this, this traditional model, OKRs grew out of management by objective, which is largely discredited now. 
And in, a, in management objective, somebody at the top, a, a CEO, a chairman, a planning team defines objectives and they are passed down, they're cascaded down to teams. And unfortunately, a lot of, a, a lot of people the type of people who wear ties more often than t-shirts, should we say, they, they tend to look at OKRs and, and they, they map them into this box in their brain called management by objective. And, and they just reinterpret it as a new name for management by objective. Um, and I think maybe that's why they appeal to the consultancies as well. But it doesn't require much familiarity with agile to notice that this is decidedly not agile. Because Agile is about getting everybody involved, everybody having a voice, involving the whole team is about pushing authority down. And if you've got one or a few people at the top of the organization that are deciding what's going to happen all the way down, you're removing that autonomy. So this is not Agile. This is, this is command and control. But it doesn't have to be this way. Let me suggest that what should be going on here is we still have our, our leaders, our planning teams, our CEOs, whoever, and they are talking about the purpose of the organization, the missions of the organization, the destinations, the objectives for the organization as a whole, the big, hairy, audacious goals. Call them what you like. They set out these things. And then we have our teams of people. And because we're living in a product value streamy type world, these teams already exist. So the leaders set out the destination, they set out the strategy. And they say to the teams, how can you help? They deliberately leave white space between the, the vision, the destination, the goal, and what the teams do. They leave this white space so the teams can then come back and the teams can say, this is how we will contribute. The team step forward and quite possibly the, the product owner, product manager type person on the team takes a lead here because they, they're the people who are talking more to stakeholders and customers. You know, they may well lead the OKR setting process, but they're not the only voice in the room. The whole team sets and agrees OKRs and they sign up for them. Okay? How we can support the leader's goals, how we will move the organization forward on our mission. So, so far I've described the, the old world as top down and then the new world as bottom up, but it's not that simple. In fact, I'm gonna say, let's abandon this model of drawing organizational diagrams with a top and a bottom. Let's think about organizations more like the solar system. You're, you're, everybody in your organization has a relationship with the CEO, the, the managing director, whoever the top person is. Everybody in the organization has a relationship with him or her, whether they know them or not. The question is, how close are they? So this is like the solar system. The, the senior people are the center. They're the sun. Yeah. And then we've got some people, some teams like Venus and Mercury, who are, are quite close in and close to the sun and whizzing around and doing stuff. And you've got others like Neptune and Jupiter, which are further out. And they're, you know, they, they may have their own micro solar system, in the case of Jupiter or something like that. You've got these teams that are float that are there circling around your, your senior leadership team. The leader sets out a vision, the teams respond with what they're going to do. And you know what? You all talk. It's not about the leaders saying to our teams, thou shalt do this. And it's not about the engineers on a team saying to the leader, this is what we will do. It's about communication and cooperation. It's about the leader saying, this is where we want to go to. And the teams come back and the teams say, this is how we think we can contribute. And they have a conversation and the leader says, mm, I don't think you've quite got it. Or I'd like you to put more emphasis over here. And the team say, but we have, the, we have these other customers we have to serve. We have these other problems. And you come to a shared understanding. And you define your API for the quarter. And then the team get on and deliver it. And if the teams need to talk to other stakeholders, other teams, if they need to get teams to deliver stuff, they have those conversations as part of the OKR setting process. But we don't have a central planning department. We don't have people on high passing instructions down to us. No, that model collapsed in 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union. 
We want autonomous teams here. I've actually started to think that it's not so much like the solar system. I, I love the solar system model of organizations, but it's more like um, rain falling on a, a puddle, on a pond, that, that creates ripples, it sends out messages. So we've got our CEO and the CEO is the, the biggest, the biggest drop in the puddle and makes a lot of waves that span out. But they're not the only person making ripples here. Your competitors are too. Doesn't matter what the CEO wants to do, the competitors can spoil the show at any time. Yeah. And um, you've got your customers as well. And customers rarely fall in line the way you want them to fall in line. They, have a, they find these pesky things called bugs. I know we shouldn't allow it, but you know, they have a problem of breaking things. So, so your team's listening to the CEO, you're perhaps observing competitors, you've got customer requests coming in, you've got your own thoughts, you know, we need to clean up some of our technology, we need to rewrite this bit, and there's other teams making demands on you. So actually you've got all these waves going on and, and sometimes they're in harmony and sometimes they're working against each other and it's totally not predictable. Yeah, the, the idea that we, we, we can set these things and cascade them down and everyone be synchronized, that doesn't exist. The world's not that simple. So it's more of a ripple model. Your organizations have a purpose. Companies exist for a reason, hopefully to benefit society. I know that's odd. Making profits is not the big thing. It's benefiting society. It may be your profits benefit society by going into pension funds, you know? Um, organizations have a purpose. They may have one or more missions they're pursuing. You know, the drugs companies are a great example at the moment. Drugs companies have a purpose. Okay, some of them try and make money. Hopefully the best drugs companies, they're, they're trying to cure illnesses, make people's lives better. And they have missions, which are, which are product lines, you know, and vaccines and things. And teams are doing OKRs. And the teams are creating OKRs, which, which build towards missions and the greater purpose. And every three months, the teams say, let's reset. Let's, let's wipe the slate clean, day one, as Jeff Bezos likes to talk about it, and reset where we're at and what we're doing. And say, challenge themselves to say, how does this team deliver benefit to, to our stakeholders, to our organizations, to our society? And every three months, we wipe the slate clean, we forget about sunk costs, we forget about partially done work, we forget about backlogs, and we say, what is our, what? are our outcomes, what are our objectives, what are the outcomes we want this quarter. As a result, I think we can supercharge prioritization. Because if you think about a normal team, where does your work come from? Okay, you're all agile, so you're all backlog, backlog, backlog. Um, Kanban teams usually have something similar to backlog, maybe a different name, but you know, backlog is supposed to drive all our work, isn't it? Except uh, you may have to handle support requests as well. You may be a DevOps team, you've got to keep upgrading those servers. You may have contact with your own sales team who have a habit of selling things you haven't built yet. You may need to go and sweet talk customers. Your customers themselves may come in and interrupt you. And you know what? You have history. You have people on a team who haven't always been on the same team in the same organization. And people have a habit of turning up at their desks and saying, you know that thing you built a year ago, could you help out with it? So work comes in from lots of places. And one approach I've heard about of OKRs is OKRs are added to this mix. So you've got these teams who are trying to burn down the backlog and do all this other stuff. And someone helpfully says, and thou shall have OKRs. And suddenly you've got another piece of work to do. Again, wearing your agile hat, you immediately spot that this causes problems of prioritization. And more importantly, it increases your work in progress. You don't magically find an extra eight hours in a day to pursue OKRs. Yeah, something's got to give. If we just add more work in progress, it's going to slow everything down. So my solution to this is you make everything subservient to the OK. Oh, sorry, sorry, that's fine. Everything becomes subservient to the OKRs. The OKRs are everything. Every three months you sit down, you think about your outcomes, your priorities. And if you're going to carry on answering support desk calls, if you're going to carry on being a DevOps team, et cetera, et cetera, you incorporate this into your OKRs, if only as a little asterisk that says, in addition, we're supporting an SLA, which means we have to do support desk calls. Or one of the approaches I talk about in the book is, is an OKR zero, which is like your baseline. You know, People love OKRs, 
because it looks like you can do a load of new shiny stuff. And that's a great way of building new products. But more and more teams, remember we live in a continuous DevOps world, more and more teams have got to support the stuff that's already out there. It's not just about recognizing new revenue, it's about revenue protection. It's about maintaining the customer base you have, keeping lights on. So we need to recognize that in our OKRs. We make OKRs the source of all work. Everything else is funneling in through the OKRs. Don't get out of bed in the morning if it's not in your OKRs. You know, do not answer the support desk if your OKRs have said you don't take support desk calls. Do not go out on a customer sales call unless it's going to contribute to your OKRs. Now that sounds hard, but these are hard prioritization questions. If we talk about them in the context of OKRs, we can talk about them as from a strategic point of view. We can give ourselves a legitimate reason to say, no, I am not coming on a sales call. No, I am not doing another support desk call. If those things are important in your organization, then fine, please do them, but recognize them as part of your OKR setting process. I hope that OKRs will allow you to be able to say no to more work. But that does not mean you let fires burn. That does not mean if there's a fire over there, you don't put it out. But I will say, if all you ever do is put fires out, then all you'll ever be is, is, is a, a fire brigade. You won't be anything else. And some organizations are like that. You've got to get the balance right between putting fires out and, and keeping the lights on and BAU and all of that and doing your new stuff. But when you're setting your OKRs, take that into consideration, bake that into the pie. The other thing there was backlog. And turns out backlogs and OKRs are a really big problem. What are you going to do? Are you going to do backlog items? Are you going to burn down the backlog? And let's be frank here, an awful lot of teams out there are, are backlog slaves. The backlog has become a tyrannical tool and teams are constantly just trying to get more and more backlog done. And again, they've lost sight of the wood for the trees. And the backlogs can be in conflict with OKRs. So when, when I was working at OKRs a couple of years ago, I wrestled with this problem. And one of the other coaches in the organization was wrestling with the same problem. And we realized there was two basic approaches we could take. We could make the OKRs the primary driver of work and the backlog was secondary, or we could craft OKRs to describe the backlog items we thought we were gonna do in the next three months. And we could then, so the backlog would be the primary driver, but we'd just be adding OKRs as an extra way of describing what we were doing. So for the next three months, her team did it that way. The backlog was in the ascendancy and my team did it with the OKRs in the ascendancy. And at the end of the three months, we sat down, we had a coffee, we talked it over and she decided she would follow my way and do the OKR first way. So my advice for your backlog, if you're using OKRs, is throw it away. Burn the backlog, delete it. If it's a clever idea, if somebody really wants it, it will come back. But you don't just do it because it's in the backlog. You do things which are in the OKRs. And if there's something in the backlog that contributes to that OKR, by all means, do it. Maybe you don't actually throw it away. Maybe you just try and forget it exists. You can go fishing in it if you think there's something useful in there. But let OKRs drive all your work. See your OKRs as a story generator. Every time you go into a planning meeting, instead of going in and finding backlog items to do, go back to your OKRs and say, where are we at? What is our highest priority now? Right, what stories can we do that will drive us forward on the OKRs? What stories can we do, which may be in the backlog, but they may not be in the backlog. If they're not in the backlog, we might write them out very quickly and put them in the backlog, or we may just write them out and do them. What can we do in the next sprint, the next period, the next whatever, that will advance the OKRs? Because frankly, if the OKRs are your priority and there's no work in the backlog that supports those priorities, you need to create it. And vice versa, if there's work in the backlog, which you're being asked to do and it doesn't support your OKRs, why should you do it? 
The OKRs are your strategic thing. They are your outcomes. It's not about burning down the backlog. So I, I hope that um, working this way, we'll be able to put an end to the tyranny of the backlog, put more purpose into our work, put purpose before the backlog. And this way, re-inject some of the fun and the excitement and the meaning of doing work, doing software. I remember years ago, I had the fortune or misfortune to work on rail track privatization. We've now seen the end of rail privatization, haven't we? I tell you, it wasn't the most fun project to work on, but you know what? I got a kick out of it, thinking all those trains going through my software. And, and um, about 18 months after, after we left the project, I remember walking through Paddington and seeing all these trains and thinking, all those trains have been through my software. And it was so meaningful. There's purpose to my work and, and that, that motivates people. And Burning down the backlog doesn't do that. So let, let's get OKRs and, and bring back a purpose. Um, so as I was saying, you know, every sprint, look at your OKR status, think about your highest priorities, ask yourself, what do we need to do to advance towards this outcome? What stories do we need? If they're in the backlog, great. If it takes you more than two minutes to find them in the backlog, they may not be there, write a new one. Just every sprint, go back to the OKRs. Every three months, reset the OKRs. And when it comes to measuring success, success is the outcome. Success is the value added, the benefit you created, the, the way you've advanced the company's mission, whether you've bettered society. These are the important things. Um, meeting 100% of OKRs is not success. Meeting 100% of OKRs implies that you're not being very ambitious in your goals. You're setting things you can meet easily. I know you hear that Google, they, they aim for 70% of OKRs as success. I don't consider 70% successful either. I think if we have a hard, you know, as much as I'm for when we're writing OKRs, hard quantifiable targets and tests, when it comes to looking at the success of the quarters, the success of the OKRs, if we have a hard target, we will meet it. We will meet it the same way that Matt, Matt Hancock met his COVID targets. We will meet it the same way the hospitals met a 48-hour discharge by discharging people into the car park and readmitting them. If you have a hard numerical target, you'll meet it. But the law of unintended consequences means that it will be in odd ways. So when it comes to looking at success, don't look at how many of your OKRs you met. That's interesting. That's data. That's good for retrospectives. But at the end of the quarter, measure success by stepping back and saying, did we, in the words of Steve, Steve Jobs, put a dent in the world? Did we make a difference? Did we deliver an outcome? Are there people out there who are doing things, working in better ways, people who are thanking us? Have we advanced society, our mission, et cetera, et cetera? Don't get hung up on the numbers when you look at success. Look at the outcome. And you know what? If, if, if you've got a very low number on your OKRs, that's, that's hopefully motivation to do better next time. Oof. So let's reawaken our agile ambition. Let's use OKRs, management like them. Let's push on an open door, but let's make sure that we as engineers, as the people doing the work, that we own OKRs and, and we make them happen. So reawaken our ambition outcomes and key results. <sighs> Great stuff. Round of applause for Mr. Kelly. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised I can get so exhausted standing in my study here. <laughs> I'm not, all the energy. That's, uh, that's what's causing that. Well, that was great, thanks Alan. And Alan, I think uh, once you've caught your breath, and you've re-energized and got some caffeine. Um, I think you were going to talk about the book raffle at this point as well. Oh, yes. yes. Has, has everyone been over to the uh, the page and put your your details in? It's, uh, it's saying 10 of you have. Um, we, I'll give, give, the, uh, give anyone else who wants to do it uh, a moment. Um, should we take one question and um, I will and then we'll we'll do that draw. Yep. So uh, 
we had a question from Maru, I think I've pronounced that right, hopefully, uh, and he said, uh, companies have invented vicious ways to break the aspect of OKRs by inventing progress indicators that are used with OKRs. Uh, he, uh, we wondered what, what you thought of that. I, I think there is merit in having a progress indicator, if only so when you come to look at your OKRs next time, you know which ones you don't need to talk about. You know which ones are ticked off, or perhaps which ones have been crossed out because you decided not to do it. Um, beyond that, I wouldn't want to get much more detailed. I think people tend to use a traffic light system. And to me, the traffic light system isn't quite clear enough. So I think I think in the book I said I had like five colours on my traffic light. But beyond that, I don't really want to get much more detail because it's up to the team to decide. I appreciate people want to know, is it looking good? Is it looking bad? But, you know, just a red and a green can kind of tell you that. Once you get into the detail, my fear is that if you want to know percentage done, and those kind of things, you to know percentage done, you need both to know how much you've done and what is the total. And if you need to know that, then you need to define what you are doing in the first place. If you need to define in great detail what you are doing, then somebody's got to codify that. So two problems there. One, do you, you, you need to do that before you start the quarter, which means somebody's working in the previous quarter, which means in the previous quarter, they're not giving it their all. They're thinking about next quarter when they should be thinking about this quarter. Secondly, again, it can be very disempowering for teams. It takes the autonomy and authority away from teams if you program it too much. Um, so my advice is to do as little forward planning as possible. The time to do it is at the start of the quarter. However, that, that will negate those, those metrics you're talking about, but I'd rather just not do them. I've got 17 responses in the system. So if I come over here, I should be able to uh, grab the names. Ooh. Uh, uh, hang on. I'm a little bit confused by what I'm seeing. But oh, it says a 20. Okay. For some reason, it showed me this name some last time as well. So I'm just going to cut out your names paste them into a, uh, a little tool I've got here. Let me change if I, if I do a uh, uh, new share, this one. This is really snazzy. I hope you can all see this. There's a wheel there with your names in it. Yes, everyone got it. So if I click on here, Oh, sorry, Patricia. Joel, are you still on the call, Joel? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Awesome. Would, would, would you like me to post the physical book or the ebook? Uh, physical book, please. Okay, I'll email you tomorrow for your address. Okay, Thank one you. more. Uh, you're, you're lucky, Joel. I was about to give myself uh, as you. <sighs> Rich Levitt. Oh, no, no, Dick's not. Tony. Ah, oh, even I was called out there. Sorry, sorry, Rich. Tony. Tony, me. Oh, no, she's also here. Oh, man. Ah, okay. Work today. Tony, uh, I, I'll drop you an email tomorrow with, with the ebook in. Okay? Okay. Thank Bye. you very much. Perfect that you should have got a book. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. Okay. I think we've got time for more questions. Excellent. Okay, uh, so we had uh, a quick one from David who asked, uh, how did Rolls-Royce receive uh, this presentation <laughs> about OKRs? Ah, ah. Uh, the engineers are very enthusiastic uh, and we had a, uh, a couple of the more senior pairs. One of their CTOs is there. Of course, they have more than one CTO. So I, I don't know whether it is a big CTO, a meaningful CTO or just... Um, the engineers are very enthusiastic. Um, as always, my backlog suggestion caught people's attention. Um, 
but they they'd admitted to me beforehand that um, they had struggled with this reconciling the backlog with OKRs. Um, so I don't know I don't know whether they're going to take my suggestion, but I know it's a problem they have been wrestling with. So um, the the people I I heard from and the connecting me on LinkedIn and so on all seem very enthusiastic. So so we'll see whether they ask me to do any more. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and we had a question from Farah. So um, Farah asked, "What are the five traffic light colours?" Oh. Uh, ahead of uh, reading the book. Uh, oh. <laughs> I think, I think I may have added clear for we've not done anything. I, I I don't I don't like things that haven't been worked on being green because nothing's gone wrong. So I think I had clear, and uh, then what I have. Um, Green, I said, was completely done. Red was stuck in a, or abandoned. Amber, as you'd expect, problematic. And I forget what other colour, but I chose one to to, to indicate um, um, not completed but not stuck, kind of ticking over nicely. Um, so I, I I haven't had a chance to try that experiment in real life. One of the things about being an author, if you ever write a book you'll discover you learn more than anyone who will ever read the book. And by putting your own thoughts down, it forces you to, to think about the way you perceive things and what you're trying to say. And you spot gaps in your own thinking. You spot things like, that that just doesn't work. So the traf my, my suggestion on traffic lights at the moment is a theory. If anyone gets a chance to try it, I'd love to hear the results. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. I think that's a great bit of insight into writing a book as well. So, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so Julia uh, asked, what do good or, or useful uh, OKRs look like? I don't, I think uh, there's one way that you, um, OKRs are a bit like user stories in that there's no such thing as a perfect OKR. What I can guarantee is every time you set OKRs, you'll see a better way of doing them, particularly the first few quarters. You'll, you'll, you'll think you set brilliant OKRs at the start of quarter two because you realise the mistakes you made. At the end of quarter three, you'll, you'll be thinking, that, oh my God, they were, they were rubbish. Um, what I would see, I'm, I'm desperate. I, I did a workshop for um, a client last week and I, I created, or oh, you probably can't see this kind of a virtual background. I created a bit of a, a, a crib sheet and uh, I gave them four things to look at. Um, is the objective an outcome? is it really a meaningful thing that you, you want to make happen, a, an outcome you want to create? Um, any of you who've seen Mike Burrow's work on agenda shift, um, there's, there's a lot of crossover here, and Mike's very keen on OKRs as well. And we, there's this common fact, this common thing about having an actual outcome, not a proxy, not a milestone, not a, a percentage report done. Um, so the, the second thing uh, I said on this crib sheet was, how does this OKR add benefit? And I was recording a podcast the other day and um, the, the people recording the podcast, I'd actually, I'd, I'd, they'd not only read my book, they'd highlighted it. And they pulled out a quote, which I'd forgotten I'd written, which is, make the benefit blindingly obvious. And, and this comes from my experience working with, with development teams and, and some marketing teams as well, actually, where the team would write an OKR and they would be really clear to themselves what the benefit of this OKR would be. And then they'd show it to some more senior people and they would say, and what's the benefit of this? And, you know, things that may be really obvious to you, you, you may have an OKR there, perhaps, you know, uh, refactor the database connection to remove the singleton, you know, and it's really obvious to any software engineer, but you, you show that to somebody outside the, and they're like, uh, 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 how's this I benefit? So you, you, you cannot be too, too obvious about the benefit. Make it difficult to ignore. Um, the, the fourth one, something I said in the presentation, how will you test the key results? What is, and yeah, you know, I've even had one team that's trying to automate their key results. They're building them into the CI pipeline. You know, how will you be able to test whether your key result has been met or not? And the important thing here is it, yes, we want to know have we passed or not. But it's not, for me, the real value is not so much 
in passing the test. The real value is in the conversation you have around what should the test be and how we're going to measure this. this. This is a bit like the BDD folks talk about clarifying specification. By forcing our conversation and make, bringing it down to a, a really a really simple test, a test that you can quantify, a test you can measure, a test you can say yes or no. It forces you to clear out your thinking. So um, how, knowing your tests for, for the key results and perhaps the objective too. Um, the other one I've got is, those of you who've read anything about OKRs, you may have noticed something I haven't talked much about here, and that's the aspirational nature of OKRs. Most of the books and blogs I've read on OKRs, um, I get a little bit fed up with them because they, they sound a bit like a sales tool. And the big selling point seems to be OKRs will, will have your teams go, go beyond their comfort zone. We'll get them to do 10x projects to deliver massive amounts. It sounds like a massive productivity type thing. And I, I don't dispute it can do that. You get, but for me, that's, that's not the important thing with OKRs. But there is, there is this, this need of some OKRs we may acknowledge are very aspirational. And we may run at them and we may fall flat on our face. We may not make it. Some of the key results might be met, but the objective might roll over. On the other hand, there are key results which people will absolutely be expecting to be delivered in the near future, in this quarter. They are essential. And I think it's good to differentiate, and I think teams usually put an asterisk by the, the essential ones. And, and there you can play a bit safe. You don't need to be so aspirational. But clarify whether these things are essential or aspirational. And, and I always say, um, keep my rule of thumb on OKRs is three objectives, each with three key results. Because three times three is nine. And four objectives, so you stretch me four objectives with four results each is 16. Key results normally, um, OKRs normally run on a quarterly basis. A quarter is 13 weeks. So if you've got nine things or you've got 16 things and you've got 13 weeks, that, that feels as if we're in the realms of possibility here. If, if, we've, got, if we've got 30 things and 13 weeks, that sounds like a backlog to me. Um, I've heard it argued that we should have one objective, just go after one thing, but I can see merit in that. I'd love to work with a team that tried it. So um, differentiate essential and aspirational. And if they are essential ones, implicit is that they'll be done by the end of the quarter, but go further and say, um, when do we need this? What, what date is this needed by? And think about um, best before and use by dates. Is there a date where if this is delivered beyond that date, it's worthless? Like delivering Christmas presents on New Year's Eve. Yeah, they're, they're worthless. You should call them something else. You should call them New Year presents. Yeah, okay. Um, Christmas presents absolutely have got a sell-by date. Okay, actually there's, there's a, a best before date with, with Christmas presents. They are, they are best delivered on the 25th or 24th if, if you happen to be from some parts of Europe. Um, so, you know, there's a best before date, you can stretch it a bit, but there is pretty much, there's, there's, there's a date beyond which you, you, do, you do not want to eat this fish. It's going to give you a stomach ache. So um, don't just stop at saying what's essential here, what's a drop dead um, OKR. Think about what the dates are. And that's also important because you may have an essential OKR. If, if the deadline passes in the middle of your quarter and you've not made it, then you probably want to write that OKR off and put your energies into the other ones. So the dates is a more subtle thing. So understand the dates around them. And so I think that those four would be my, my, my things to look at on OKRs and then add in the, the fifth one of, um, if you're going to get folks out of OKRs, you need to limit them. So, you know, three OKRs is about the maximum. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we got a question from Spijek, uh, who says, can you think of an example uh, of a product or, or an organisation or, or uh, sorry, an environment or domain where OKRs may not be the best uh, sort of tool or 
philosophy to, to take? Uh, well, I kind of mentioned before these business as usual, keeping the lights on organizations where you, you are, you are just, um, fixing bugs and you haven't got any great aspirations. You might still write some OKRs around remove, eliminating the bugs altogether. Or, you know, if, if you're an operations center and most of your work is just upgrading machines, you might still have OKRs around automating it. Um, but they're the obvious ones where I think they, they wouldn't apply so much. And there's still a need for some kind of strategic thinking. There's still a need to think about for the next quarter, the next year, what are our, what are our goals beyond just changing light bulbs? Um, and I think there are some problems which OKRs aren't good at addressing. So, for example, in there, I f it feels as if a lot of organizations expect that they can add OKRs and the culture will follow. Because OKRs are failure tolerant, you will start to get an organization which is failure tolerant. And I don't get that. I think the reason why Google are successful with OKRs is Google have a culture which, which is friendly towards teams being aspirational and potentially failing. I think it's rather difficult to set OKRs in an environment which doesn't really support that. And it may be difficult to set OKRs around changing that environment. Um, years and years ago, uh, I was living in the States and I remember hearing a radio program um, where there's a couple of management consultants talking about how they tried to apply management consultancy to their relationship. So these, these management consultants were partners and they work for different companies, but they set, started the year by writing their goals for their relationship for the year. And they started to write about what, what their, uh, so it wasn't just the goals, but what they thought they were going to be doing. And they set themselves criteria and they ran their relationship for a year, like they ran their consultancy practices. And at the end of the year, uh, they reported that they got together and they actually achieved most of what they set out to achieve as a great success. But in the process, the fun had gone from their relationship and they weren't enjoying it so much. Uh, so don't apply OKRs in your families. <laughs> uh, although it might have some use with my 12-year-old when he gets to the GCSEs. Uh, yeah, so, um, and also look at your organization. There may be problems which require a different type of solution. Thank you. Yeah, I think that kind of, uh, you've maybe touched upon this next question a little bit, but uh, maybe you've got some, some further uh, information that you, you may be able to add. So the question is, um, is there some sort of organisational prerequisite uh, in order to uh, apply OKRs, some sort of maturity uh, level, if you like? Uh... <sighs> You know what, over the years, I've read so many people saying, don't do agile if your organization is like this. Don't do agile if your developers are like that. Don't do agile if your managers are like that. And I've seen all sorts of organizations try it. And um, a bit like having babies, there's no law against it. And so I would like to say you need a culture where you've got psychological safety because you should be embracing failure. I would like to say you ha need to have a culture where people aren't obsessive about predictability, because if you're going to be ambitious, you can't be predictable at the same time. Um, I would like to say you've got a culture where your leaders respect people lower down and they're not going to try and pre-program what they're doing too much. Um, I suppose some other things I'd like to say, but you know what? I don't think we can set any fast rules about who should and who shouldn't try OKRs. And quite often, again, as with Agile, it's, it's not so much that OKRs solve a problem out of the box, but like so much of Agile, they show you where your problems are. And so you're setting OKRs every three months. OKRs are more strategic than a backlog. OKR setting is more strategic than a sprint. But that means you need to have a company strategy. That means you need to have a strategy which not only exists on paper, but has been communicated with people and has been communicated well to people. And if you struggle setting OKRs, it may be because your strategy is lacking. And the people who are supposed to be in charge of strategy are not communicating it clearly. So I'd like to say, 
don't try saying OKRs okay, if you aren't clear what your business strategy is. But you know what? It may be that in trying to set OKRs, you realize that the business strategy is a bit of a mess. So very non-committal there for me, very much a consultant there. It depends. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm gonna jump one question ahead and then go, go back to Michael's because I think the next question kind of f follows on from, from what you've just been saying there. So. Uh, Julia asks, so can you transition to OKRs uh, or does it have to be an all or nothing? I think there are things you can do and those things, the more support, so, so I've, I've long believed with Agile, there's a lot of Agile you can just do whether the managers want to use it or not, you can just JDFI, JFDI. With OKRs, I think it's really more important to have somebody in a leadership position supporting you, if only because you want someone to give you air cover. You want somebody who the team can take a draft set of OKRs to and say, this is what we plan to do in the next quarter. Does this look right to you? And can you give us some protection while we try and follow this plan? So. I think you do need somebody um, to give you some 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 air covers. I, I tend to think of it, um, but I don't think that needs to be the entire organisation. Um, and in fact, the experimental side of me doesn't want it to be the entire organisation. I'd rather you set up some pilots. I'd rather you find some teams to say, "Look, we're going to try doing this." And we will experiment with it here. We will learn. We will we will teach other people. We'll create our own case studies. So, I think you you can do this. Um, and certainly, I think about the the organisation I was working with. It felt to me as if everybody was doing OKRs because there was like what was it eight nine teams in in this um, division of the organisation. The fact was, this division was one of about three or four, and the other parts hadn't. So, I think there are things you can do. And I think you can at least have a speculative conversation with your immediate team and say, look, if we were going to have OKRs, what would we write? And you can have a conversation, well, how would that change what we we're doing? So I think you can take steps in this direction, but I do think you need, you need some support. But go and ask those people, go and interest in them. Thank you very much. Uh, and we had uh, one final question um, from Michael. Unfortunately, he's had to drop off. Oh, um, uh, but he's asked, uh, how are we improving the lives of our customers and adding value to the business? Uh, I assume around the introduction or use of OKRs. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe OKRs don't represent an improvement over what you're doing at the moment. Maybe if you've got a well-oiled machine that is ticking over and stuff's going into the backlog and a few weeks later it's being delivered, then maybe you've reached a sweet spot and uh, you, know, you, you just need to tweak it rather than a massive change. I'm not sure every organization is there. And I go back to the backlog problem I, I keep mentioning. For so many teams, the backlogs become a slave driver. It's just about delivering stuff in the backlog and the backlog never gets any smaller. It fills up as, as quickly as you do it. We've, we've created the, these bottomless pits, particularly electronic bottomless pits, which we all have this year, don't we? Um, you know, as I always say, in Jira, no one can hear you scream. In the days when you used to have a physical backlog sitting on somebody's desk, you could tell you had too much to do. Now it's electronic, easy come, easy go. Um, and I, I would question whether just churning through features in a backlog is the best way to add customer value. If you go down that route, you end up with the MP3 players we had before the iPad pod. You know, they're full of features, they're wonderful, but they're, they're not particularly usable, they're not particularly enjoyable. I think OKRs give us an opportunity to step back and say, really, what, what is it our customers will benefit from? What will our, our other stakeholders benefit from? You, you could tie these things into jobs to be done. Whatever it is about, you know, taking a step back and, and looking a bit wider. Now, there's a challenge here in that 
when we're setting OKRs, we do want to think widely. We do want to think about stakeholders. We do want to think about a bigger picture. And, and then when we're executing, we need to put the blinkers on and deliver these things. But too many teams, they, they live in the blinkered state permanently and they don't get a chance to step back and look more widely and say, you know what, you know, we may be doing good stuff, but you know what, we may be, we may be in a suboptimal position. We may be adding features and selling to our existing customers, but there's a whole another customer segment over there we haven't touched. So I, I think, I think, yeah, that you may be in a sweet spot. You may not want to change everything, but you know, give it a try, experiment. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think that brings us to the to the end of our, our questions. Um, so thank you ever so much, Alan, for uh, for answering them. Uh, Simon, I'll hand over to to you. To... Yep. Thanks, Gordo. Thanks, Jeff. And yes, indeed. Thanks to to Alan as well. Um, lots of good comments in the chat here, thanking Alan for his time and the uh, quality of the presentation. Uh, I love the virus metaphor. I thought it was great. A very apt at the moment. I thought it was great. And especially the um, the agile in its commoditized corporate form in its weakened form. Yeah, that's an important point. We're often kind of trying to <clears throat> push ourselves, stretch forward, and we're often we always want to improve, and we're perhaps more conscious on what we haven't achieved rather than what we have, which links to Alan's piece about the OK. Look at how you have moved the needle rather than what you didn't achieve. But probably even that you know agile in its weakened form may well be better than what. You were doing before and it, it's probably better than many of the alternatives you know if, i think if we are genuinely focusing on you know genuinely adopting an evolutionary approach towards developing our products if we're not focusing on hitting dates and landing in budget but we're actually focusing more on kind of meeting folks needs meeting customers needs delivering value probably doing all right better than a lot of the alternatives so thanks, Alan. Thanks to our friend, friend of CAE, David Lake, who connected us with Alan Kelly. Uh, thank you, David. As always, a uh, really great presentation. I have an entire OneNote page of notes uh, that I'm going to take away. Some great stuff there and the book as well. Available in all good and probably bad bookshops as well. So awesome stuff. Thank you to everyone here, our participants. There's some really awesome questions on there as well, by the way, and great engagement. Um, so nice job. It always makes it loads better when we get that kind of input and engagement from the crowd as well. So thanks. I, I was muted, but thank you for the fact shout out and hello, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> it's Mr. David. All right. So I think we're done. Um, that was really good. Of course, if you are on our Slack channel, you can continue the conversation there. If you're not and you would like an invite, then you may spam uh, any one of the facilitators, Simon, Farah or Gordon. And we shall spam you back with an invite to our Slack channel. Have a look at the Twitter group as well, CAE Meetup. And we would love to see you in the future as well. So one last thank you for Mr. Kelly. Well done, Sarah. Congratulations. And uh, we hope to see you at a conference and a presentation in the future, sir. All right, everybody. Have a safe trip to the other part of your house where you're going now, okay? And see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>